So hi everyone, my name is Radoslav Dimitrov and today I'm going to be presenting the last problem from the last cook cook-off of Kochev. So yeah, here's like a small side about me. So, hi, right now I'm uh, studying in Oxford and yeah, like I did quite a lot of competitive programming before and right now I'm also like following the platforms. But yeah, today I'm going to be talking about the last problem, which was basically graph labeling. And yeah, let's just go straight to the problem statement. So basically we have like a graph and we have like, first we will define two things for this graph. And the first one will be this function r, which is for two vertices u and v. And it will basically define whether we can reach u from v. And yeah, like, again, want to point out that the graph was directed. So in other words, like, if we can reach u from v, this doesn't necessarily mean that we can reach v from u. So yeah, this is like the first function that's defined in the problem statement. So yeah, here it's defined like in the first part of the statement. And uh, also we'll, when we have like r for, for u, u, or like when the two vertices are the same in this function r, it will just be true. So yeah, let's then go to the next definition, which is like this n thing, which is basically all vertices, so n for some vert vertex would be a set of vertices and it will be this set so that basically we can reach v from u and also we can reach u from v. Or in other words, it's the set of vertices such that we can reach each vertex from all other vertices. So yeah, maybe some of the more experienced contestants would actually see what n means and I'm gonna share it in the solution in a bit. And finally, we have like two more definitions, which are out and in. And this will basically represent the set of edges, which are incoming or outcoming for some vertex. Or in this small example that I mentioned, for example, if we have this, this node, the set of incoming edges are like, I'm just gonna cross them with red. So like, this is the first in, out, outcoming edge, and this is like the second outcoming edge. So yeah, for this vertex, like the set will have those two edges, while for the incoming edges, it will be just this one. So yeah, similarly, the n thing, or like the second function we defined would be, if we like want to see the, like the n for this vertex, it would be the set of these vertices. Or you can see that this kind of looks similarly to a cycle. So okay, basically, I mean, what the problem asks is to, I mean, apart from like all, all, all these definitions, we also have some queries. But like the queries are just given in some sense as constraints. And they basically mean that, so, okay, every query is defined for a set of vertices, which is, which can either be like a single vertex, like the, I mean, like every constraint is basically given as like a type which is a type for the edges and also like either like some component of vertices or like just a single vertex. Or in other words, like basically each constraint would be as simple as a type of edge, then like left and right, which will represent the smallest and the largest number of edges we can have of this type. And then some set where the set can be determined by four types. So the first one is basically all the outgoing edges for some component of some vertex that's given. So W I is given, or it's, or it can be like the incoming edges. And similarly, we just define it for a single vertex. So yeah, we have like all four types of constraints. And also like the idea is to basically assign each edge a, a type, which can be either one or two. And like every edge, when we have like an edge of type one, it will have cost C1. While if we assign type two, it will have cost C2. And basically the problem asks to find such a labeling that it can, I mean, it will satisfy all of the constraints. And again, I remind that we pick for each, every edge, it will be either with 
label one or like type one, or to have like label two or type two. And again, like the constraints are defined for some set and like some X, Y, which is like the label. Or in other words, like it, it may be like you're given some set of edges and some label, for example, one, like the label can be either one or two. And this, and then like some two numbers L and R, and this will mean that the label of the number, so in this set S, the number of edges of type like XI, which is given, should be between L and R. So yeah, I think I explained the problem statement. So yeah, let's go to the solution. And we'll be solving it in, I mean, problems like that seem kind of complicated when you first read them, but if you just keep, I mean, basically one way to solve them is to basically simplify the problem. And that's what we are gonna be doing today. And I'm gonna be presenting it as like a sequence of observations. And then there'll be like small recap and we'll see what will happen with the problem. So yeah, I mean, simplification is key in problems like that because like when you just look at it in the beginning, there are just so many details and it's kind of hard to actually understand what the problem asks you to do. So yeah, one way to think about it, we have like all of those definitions. So let's see what they actually mean. And here comes like the first observation. So you remember this NV definition? It actually represents the strongly connected components. And for people who are unfamiliar with strongly connected components, it's in a way like the component such that you can reach each vertex from every other vertex. And also like one thing to notice that if we compress the vertices in strongly connected components, every vertex will appear in exactly one strongly connected component. For example, like in this case, basically our strongly connected components would be as follows. So the first one would be like this large thing, which I'm covering with red right now. Then we'll have like this one, which is just a single vertex. And then we have like this third one and then this fourth one. So yeah, we have like well, th those four connected components. And I mean, like you can think of the strongly connected components as some cycles, but yeah, I mean, there are some standard algorithms that compute them. One of them is like Torjans, then there is like Kujuharas. And yeah, basically like those are the two algorithms that are mainly used and they are linear in time, depending on edges and uh, vertices. So yeah, that, that's like the first observation that's, that you pretty much need to notice so that you can actually come up with some solution. So, okay, now let's basically go to the second observation. Also, by the way, feel free to ask some questions if you have any, like maybe during the session. I should have mentioned it in the beginning, but yeah, that's, I mean, if you just have any questions, feel free to ask them and I'm gonna be answering them throughout the session. Also like in the end of, after like I present the solution, you can just ask me something if you want. But yeah, like that was the first observation which is basically related to strongly connected components. And we kind of, kind of need it for the solution. So now the second solution, uh, the second observation is actually related to the costs. So as basically we actually wanted to find the such a labeling that it has like minimal cost. And I mean, it's kind of weird because like when we look at the constraints of the problem, so yeah, that's like the problem statement and look at the costs, we can see that they don't really have like, I mean, C1 being less than C2. So let's just assume that C1 is less than or equal to C2 without loss of generality. That's because if that wasn't the case, we can just flip the type XY for all constraints because I mean, we basically just interchange the two types. So we will just swap the costs and then all constraints that were for label one will be for label two. But yeah, I mean, that's observation two. It's very simple, but we actually need it later on in the solution. Okay, so we have those two observations. And now let's go to the third observation, which is actually one of the most important ones so basically, it says the following. Imagine that we have some constraint that's for type two or like, okay, I, I, again, like it's for type two and we have assumed from the previous observation that the cost of the observations, uh, the cost of the 
label one edges is less than the cost of label two edges. So yeah, I mean, like right now, again, the problem is pretty complex. So we want to reduce it to something. And like the first observation we can use, the, the next observation we will use is that we can actually convert the constraints of type two to constraints of type one. Or in other words, we would just have constraints of a single type. And I mean, like you can see why solving something that has multiple types would be normally harder than solving something that just has a single type. And actually like converting constraint from type two to a constraint of type one is relatively simple. We basically have, imagine that we have like some constraint that has, okay, yeah. So I just saw that there was a question that we will, uh, like about the strongly connected component algorithm. I mean, it doesn't really matter what algorithm you'd use. Maybe you can use Cosarrarus. I mean, from the pronunciation is pretty hard for me. So yeah, that has like one choice. The other one is Torjans. Like both of them are fine because they were linear. So yeah, we would use one of them for to actually find the connected components. But yeah, I mean, I think that's this answers your question. If, I mean, if you, you just like, if you have some something more to ask about it, I can explain in more detail. But yeah, we can use whatever algorithm for strongly connected components we want, because like most of them are linear in time. So going back to the observation. So, I mean, I guess some of you already figured out how we can con convert like some constraints of type two to a constraint of type one. But like the main idea is that Imagine that we have like a constraint for some count of the number of edges of type two being in the interval from left to right. This is actually equivalent. I mean, like this count also just to note is for some set, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, like imagine we have some, some constraint that should be like, like the count of the edges in some set of type two should be between left and right. This. So now we can actually, we know what's the size of the whole set because that's given to us. So in other words, like this is equivalent to having the count of the constraints of type one between the overall number minus R to the overall num number of edges minus L, L. We can try like convincing yourselves, but I mean, you basically have like two types and it's basically the same fixing the count fixing a range for the count of the first one and the second one. I mean, like we can basically inter interchange them. And that's what we are basically gonna do. So all constraints that are of type two will basically go into constraints of type one. And I mean, it's as simple as just flipping L and R and then like multiplying by minus one and adding the number of edges. In other words, like this is basically the conversion. And like after this point, we will basically have only constraints of type one. And this is simpler than before. So yeah, that's this observation. If you have some question about it, feel free to ask. Okay, so after that, there is another observation, which is like the final one before I make a quick recap of the problem and how it will look like after this free observation we did. Like this next observation is pretty simple, but Imagine that we have some, yeah, let me just go to it. So imagine that we have some constraints that are for the same node. So in other words, like we have some incoming edges, but we have like multiple queries that are for the same set. Or in other words, I'm gonna go to the problem now. Basically, imagine that we have some query, which is of type one and for some vertex WI and we have like multiple of those queries that can easily happen because when we look at the constraints of the problem, you can see that the number of, like the overall number of uh, constraints may go to six to the power, six multiplied by 10 to the power of five. So that's like 600,000. Well, actually the number of nodes is much less. It's, I mean, it's 10 times lower, which actually reminds you that there is some reason that I mean, basically, if we have like two query, two constraints that are for the same type and argument, we can actually combine them. And like combining them is relatively simple. Imagine that you have like 
a constraint for the same node and the same like, like constraint of some type, like for example, incoming edges for some node. I mean, like if we have some constraints that that's L1, R1, and then some other constraints that's L2, R2, we can easily combine them by just picking the larger left bound and the smaller right bound. And this way we can drastically reduce the overall number of constraints because like we want we'll have at most one constraint for the incoming edges of some node the outcoming edges of some node and then like we will also have some i mean at most one uh, for incoming edges into a strongly connected component and at most one for outcoming edges of some cons of some you know, strongly connected component and like if we want to bound them properly so we have like at most two for like incoming and outcoming for every node and at most two for every strongly connected component. Like the number of strongly connected components is at most N. So that's like at most four N constraints, which is less than, le less than the overall number of queries that we can get. So yeah, that, that's like a very simple observation, which basically tells us that we should, I mean, if we have like the same constraints, we should basically like combine them. Okay, so now I'm gonna give a recap of the problem because it, it may actually sound easier now. So yeah, like the recap is basically the following. So every strongly connected component and I'm gonna basically go through the points. So every strongly connected component or node has like a constraint. Here I mean like there are basically technically it has like two constraints where one for incoming edges and one for outcoming edges also like all constraints constraints are for type one because like we used observation three to convert the observation to convert the constraints type two to constraints type one and finally we have like the cost of the first one being less than the cost of the second one like labeling with type one is uh, less than labeling with type two. Okay, so as we want to minimize the cost, we actually want to maximize the number of edges of type one. That's like what we will get from this, from this recap. And what I mean by this is, all right, we know that the cost of edges of type one is actually less than the cost of edges of type two. That's because we already fixed this. Okay, and also every edge has some type. So in other words, like if we fix the number of edges of type one, then we know the number of edges of type two. And like, if we want to minimize the overall cost, we want to maximize the number of edges that are less expensive. So yeah, in other words, we'll just maximize the number of edges of type one. And that's pretty useful because ac this actually leaves us to, I mean, to, to the solution, which will basically be related to flaws, which I think some of the more experienced participants already guessed. But yeah, I mean, I guess like for, for someone who has participated in some contests, after reaching with those simple observations, try solving this like with this new reduction, because like when you try max, when you think of the problem as maximizing the number of edges of type one, then you can actually have like more approaches. So yeah, maybe if you want, you can try think about it before like continuing with watching this video, but yeah, I'm gonna continue with the solution. So yeah, how to actually check whether the actually whether the answer is minus one or like it's impossible because we also had to see whether it's possible because sometimes it may happen that there is no labeling that actually corresponds to the constraints we have to the, to the constraints we have and i mean as i said we would actually use flaws so yeah we would use flaws but with dependencies which is a kind of tricky algorithm but we would actually just use it as a black box and I mean, there are some tutorials. I'm gonna, in the end of the solution, I'm gonna link one tutorial or I'm gonna show it here in the presentation. It's on CP algorithms. 
but yeah, I think the explanation there is pretty nice. So yeah, like we would use flow with dependencies and let me actually explain what this means. So imagine we have like, normally when we talk about max flow, we actually have like for every edge, we have just some capacity and we just want to find the maximal flow that we can push from the sink to the source, uh, from the source to the sink, such that we will always push at most the capacity flow through every edge. However, when we talk about flow with dependencies, we also have an additional constraint for every edge. That's like the lower bound of uh, the flow for every edge. So in other words, instead of having just a capacity, we also have like the lower bound for uh, this edge. So in other words, we have a bunch for, for every edge, we have some interval left, right, which will basically define the, we basically need to have a flow that that is a number for, between left and right that we pushed through this edge. I mean, in other words, we also have like lower bound capacities. And I mean, it's actually solvable by just extending the graph with two more sync, with an additional sync and an additional source. So in other words, we basically, I mean, the solution is basically we add one more, two more vertices, which will be like a pseudo sync and a pseudo source. Then we basically link them with some of the vertices inside. And this way we can just use the normal max flow to actually solve the max flow with dependencies. So in other words, like there is like a construction which converts your network with dependencies to a normal max flow. And it's basically again with the same complexity because we got just two more vertices. And also like there we add basically at most n edges. So the only difference is that to solve the dependency version, we would add like two vertices and like some number of edges. But again, it's pretty fast. So this construction can be seen in this tutorial I'm gonna link. But again, going back to this problem, it's actually not that easy to see how we'll model our problem as a flow with dependencies. Because, I mean, this is the tricky part of the problem, I guess. So let's go straight to this slightly trickier part. So we will construct the graph as follows, like the network will be as follows. So initially, again, uh, right now I'm explaining how we would construct a network that has dependencies on the edges. So in other words, like all edges in this network will have like a lower bound and an upper bound. And then we will feed this thing into the black box solver for maximum flow in with dependencies. Okay, so uh, basically our network will look as follows. We'll have a source, we'll also have a sink. And the intermediate things will be the following. So we will have four layers in between where the first layer will be the strongly connected components. And it will, so basically like, this layer here will rep represent the basically like the strongly connected components and their outgoing basically the constraints for the outgoing edges. Then the second one would be basically it will represent all vertices and every vertex will be connected to the strongly connected component from the previous layer that it's corresponds to basically like every vertex is in exactly one strongly connected component. So we are going to link the strongly connected component with this vertex in the second layer. And the constraint here would be basically the vertex constraint for the outgoing edges. Then we will have like the edges in between. And finally, similarly, we would have the vertex constraints for the in for the basically for the out for the incoming edges for a certain vertex. Okay, so I mean like, if we think of the network as that, basically it's kind of hard. So I can, I've actually drawn it here. So I think this will be easier for for the people to actually see what I meant. So, okay, the network will look as follows. So I'm gonna, be, first I'm gonna actually start from the middle because that's the easiest way to explain it. 
So imagine that we actually have a bipartite graph where we actually duplicate every vertex from our initial graph. And we, for every edge, that's for example, from vertex X to vertex Y, we'll connect the vertex X from the left part to, to its duplicates on the right part. So in other words, every edge will appear exactly once in this bipartite graph, like the one over here. So, I mean, basically this is like the second and the third layer. And also like every constraint for those edges will be between zero or one. And now I'll explain what this constraint will mean. We are actually making this flow network for the number of edges that are basically of type one. As we wanted to maximize the number of edges of type one, what we can do is actually model the whole thing as a network. And like I already mentioned that every edge will appear in this middle layer exactly once. And it will have capacity zero or one. So in other words, like the bijection here will be that a certain edge would have capacity zero when it's of type two, and it will have capacity one when it's of type one. So yeah, in other words, here we would have like the edges of type one and we want to maximize it. So in other words, we want to maximize the flow that goes through this middle layer. So, okay, I mean, if the problem was just this, we would have been done. But like, now we have like the constraints, which is the complex part of the problem. So actually, that's why we add those two layers, like the one for strongly connected components. I mean, the incoming strongly connected components the outcome so, so yeah that's like the outcoming strongly connected components and also we have like the second layer again for strongly connected components which is for the incoming edges so yeah in a way we can see that in the middle we have this bipartite graph and every vertex appears in both sides of the bipartite graph so yeah i mean like these edges are basically in some sense the at least like on the left side, in some sense, that's, those are the outgoing edges. Because like for some vertex V1, we are basically connecting it to the reachable vertices. I mean, like the adjacent vertices in the right side. So in other words, like we will have like the outcoming edges here for, for this vertex. So in other words, we somehow need to fix the, their number with a constraint. And that's why we will actually have the out vertex constraints that will connect the strongly connected component with this vertex. So in other words, like here where you see this red LR that I'm actually writing on right now, here we will have like the constraint for the incoming edges. So in other words, like we have like the constraint for the number of incoming edges, uh, the, the, for the number of outcoming edges from V1. And if we, fix it on this edge, then we will always, I mean, this will basically limit the flow that goes through these edges, which are like the outcoming ones, to be overall at mo between left and right. As again, like when we have like this uh, flow with demands, we can, every edge will have cost one only when uh, we have chosen that its type will be one and we want to maximize the number of edges of type one. <clears throat> so yeah, in other words, basically, as again, all of the constraints are for type one. So we can just put the constraint for the vertex outcoming edges here. And now what we will do about the strongly connected components, it's pretty similar, but we are gonna link the sync with the following strongly connected component with the constraint, that's the overall number of edges that we are, that are gonna be of, of type one, that we're gonna go to basically this strongly connected components, component. So yeah, in other words, we just have like, this second LR will be the outgoing, it will be the constraint for outgoing number of edges for the, for, for the corresponding strongly connected component. So yeah. This will mainly work because every vertex is in exactly one strongly connected component. So in, in some sense, we are first, when we 
when we look at the range, which is from the sink to the strongly connected component, like the first strongly connected component layer, we are bounding the number of edges so that it will be okay, depending on the constraints that are related to strongly connected components. And then between the layer with the vertices, so like the first layer in the bipartite graph, like between the layer for the strongly connected components and this layer for vertices, we are basically bounding the constraints, which are for outgoing edges, but for vertices. So yeah, now we are basically, we have basically fixed the first type, the first two types of constraints. But now we also need to somehow fix them for outgoing edges. But here comes the benefit of actually having duplicated this graph. Because like when you look at the right side of this graph, every vertex will be actually adjacent to only the vertices that are incoming to it. So in other words, like we are basically we'll basically have for every vertex, the incoming edges being adjacent to it. So in other words, like I'm gonna draw a bit. So it's in a way we'll change this, like this graph right now, but like imagine this vertex, which is from here before. And I mean, like it will just have two vertices, two edges coming to it. And if we have some constraints on the edge from it to the strongly connected component, that's, for example, we want the outgoing edges of this vertex to be between 0 and 1, like the outgoing edges that are of type 1, of course. Then we basically have like v2 here and v4 here. So yeah, in a way, like we will know that we can't have both of the, these two edges being of type 1, because we know that their overall sum or like the sum of their flows should be between zero and one. So yeah, this way we are basically doing the incoming capacities or like the incoming constraints. And I mean, having like these two constraints, we can similarly, I mean like basically you can see that this layer, which is between the second part of the bipartite graph and the second strongly connected component layer is similar to the first one, which is like between for the outgoing edges. So in a way, we can basically do the same thing for the outgoing edges of the strongly connected components, but it will be between the layer of the strongly connected components and the sink T. So yeah, in other words, like here you can see, um, I have also written the descriptions. And as a recap, in the middle, we will have the actual edges where the bijection would be that every edge exists exactly once. I mean. The, that's because we have it's every edge would be from the left side of the bipartite graph to the right side. And yeah, basically, if it has flow equal to one, then it will be of type one. And if it has flow of type two, it will be of type two. So yeah, in other words, that's pretty much it. We would basically have the constraints as follows. In the middle, the actual edges, then to the left, we have like the outgoing constraints, and to the right, we have the in incoming constraints. And yeah, if we have like this, this network flow, we are basically bounding the capacities in the, of the flow in the middle. And I mean, if we basically, I mean, we'll have impossible solution if and only if we can't push the flow from S to T. So yeah, basically that's like, the flow with dependencies problem. I guess like if there are, I mean like, I guess here, if you have so many questions, feel free to ask because I mean, the flow network is a bit confusing. So if you just have anything that troubles you, just feel free to ask as, I mean, this is the most important part. And after that, we are basically having like a black box solver for this thing. And yeah, I mean, you can, it, the whole problem, is given in a slightly tricky way because we have all of these definitions. Then we have like multiple types and it's hard to actually, I mean, it's kind of tricky to actually see that we just need to represent ev everything so that we can feed it into some black box solver. But yeah, I mean, 
that's why normally when we are solving a problem, we should always start by trying to simplify some bits of it. And here I gave some examples of how to actually do some of the simplifications. But yeah, I mean, feel free to ask now or like in the end of the session. But after this point, we basically have, right now we know how to check whether the whole thing is impossible or not, which is like with flow with dependencies, which is again, a black box thing. And I mean, actually we want to maximize the number of, we want to maximize the flow. And it turns out that basically we can just solve the, I mean, when we run the flow with dependencies, we will actually get the max flow. If we, we first, so again, I, I'm talking a bit about some things that I haven't really written here, but are mostly about the solver. As in a way, it's kind of hard to actually fit explaining the whole approach with flow with dependencies here, but I'm gonna link a tutorial, which is pretty short. But the main idea is that you would have like the source and the sink and I mean, you would just run the flow to first check whether it will be impossible. And then to actually find the maximal flow, you would run the flow algorithm from the first source and the first sink. I mean, like we basically have in the flow with dependencies approach, we will actually duplicate this graph with adding like another sink. I'm gonna have it here, T1. And another source, which will be somewhere here, like on the left. And then what we will do, we will basically, in the middle, we would actually convert the costs, not the costs, but the capacities a bit. And instead of having a dependency, we would have an edge which has capacity equal to R minus left. And finally, we would compute the, in the I mean, like basically, right now I'm just telling the general idea of the flow with dependencies solution. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but like we are gonna complete, compute the degree or like the incoming left constraints and the outcoming left constraints with sign. So with sign. So in other words, like for this vertex, we are gonna compute the left bounds with minus and the outcoming edges with plus. And then this way we would have some degree, which is depending on the left, the left bound of the constraints of the incoming and outcoming edges. And I mean, like basically if the degree is positive, we would link this vertex to the, we will link the sink with this vertex. And if it's negative, we will link this vertex with the sink, like the second sink. So yeah, depending on the sign, we would either add an edge from the second source to this one, or we would add an edge from the first node to the second one. Uh, we will, we will, and if like it's negative, we would add an edge from the current vertex to the second sink. So yeah, I mean like that's generally the idea, but honestly, normally you it's not a hard thing and it's just a black box. So you would you have to like come up with the constraints problem, and then if you have seen it, it's a pretty straightforward thing to actually convert it to a normal flow. So yeah, I mean, the main idea is to first run the whole algorithm, like a max flow algorithm from the second sink to the second source to check whether it's impossible. And then like you would have some capacities or some flow that is already pushed through the edges in this new network from the first source to the second, to the sink. And what you, you'll do is just push some flow from the first source to the, to the first sink. So in other words, it's just running max flow twice, but like running the second flow would already have some already pushed flow from the previous run. And yeah, I mean, it can be proven that this works. It, it's actually something that you actually study in some algorithmic courses that are harder. There are also like a bunch of papers online if you really want to see what's the background about it. But in general, it's not a, such a hard thing. So yeah, I mean, you basically use this part as a black box. And yeah, like here, I guess I'm gonna show the tutorial. It's on CP algorithms. So yeah, I'm gonna open it in my browser. I hope everyone sees it. 
again, like feel free to ask some questions if you have. So yeah, I mean, it's easy to find it. Basically you open CP algorithms, then you can, let's just search for flow. And I think it's flow with dependence, with demands, okay. But yeah, that, that's in general the idea. And as you can see, it's a pretty small thing. So yeah, here they basically explain how to do the arbitrary flow thing. And yeah, I mean, that's what I described. We have like a second source S prime and the second source, a second sink T prime. Then we compute the demands, which are like the lower bounds for every vertex. As like, I mean, in other words, basically we, the cost for two vertices would be the difference between the incoming and the outcoming lower bound demands. In this article, they're using actually D for a lower bounds and C for upper bounds. And I mean, the flow should be between them. I was using left and right because I feel it's, I mean, kind of more reasonable because it explains more, but they also have the, I mean, they, I, I guess they just want to keep the capacity being the upper bounds. But yeah, like in general, that's it. Finally, also like something I forgot to mention, when you're creating this new flow graph, you also add this new edge, which is from the sink to the source, but like the previous ones that we, like, like the actual source and sink, not the, new, not the ones you newly created. And yeah, I mean, like after basically creating this new network, you can just, they also have a, a proof of why the transformation is actually correct. But yeah, like in general, you would use this thing. And yeah, I guess like maybe let's talk about the complexity now, but let's actually analyze the number of edges and vertices in this uh, strongly connected, I mean, in this network flow that we actually created. So yeah, like I've already written it down below, but maybe let's just do this again. So let's first see what's the number of vertices. So we have like every strongly connected, every strongly connected components has two vertices for it. And also like every vertex has two, vert two vertices in the network for it. Like one on the left side of the big protect graph and the one on the right side. And also have like the sink and the source. So overall, this makes like two, like the source and sink. Let me actually, so that everyone sees. So yeah, overall we'll have like two vertices for the source and the sink, two n for the vertices, and then two for every strongly connected component. But we know that the strongly connected components are less than the number of vertices, which is n. So we have like at most four n plus two vertices. And the number of edges is similar. We basically have like two n. I mean, like we basically have like. Let's. I'm just gonna go here. So because of the bijection, we have every edge exactly once, one once on the left side and once on, I mean, every edge is, a, is basically there exactly once because of the bijection. I mean, it basically connects something from the left side to something from the right side. So we have like M edges here, and then we have for every vertex, we have like one outgoing edge to the strongly connected component is in. And also like on the other side, like here, we have also N edges, which are basically for, from the strongly connected components to the vertices. And yeah, and finally we have basically the same thing from the strongly connected components to the source and to the sink, actually the other way around. But yeah, in general, there would be like M in the middle plus, plus two N plus two strongly connected components count, which again, because of the same reasoning as above is less than or equal to M plus four N. But yeah, in general for the constraints, I'm gonna go to the problem page now. I mean, basically the constraints were around 30,000. So like the whole network won't be that large. So yeah, it will be around 10, like 100,000. And because like, 
the constraints are in this middle layer are basically zero or one, or in other words, like the capacities are one. Actually, just running a DINs or a push relabel is fine and it will work fast enough. Like in general, in problems with flows, uh, it's kind of hard to actually find the exact complexity. But yeah, in this case, it works pretty fast because we have just some dependencies and in the middle layer, we just got zeros and ones. So yeah, but basically like that's pretty much it about the idea behind the solution. So to recap it, we have the following observations. First, we see what, because the problem was pretty hard, first we saw what N meant, and it was a strong connect component. Then we actually fixed that the cost of the first stage would be, of the first type would be less than the cost of the second type. Then we actually converted all the constraints to be of the first type, because we want to simplify it even more. Then we combined all constraints that are for the same vertex or the same strongly connected component so that we just have some basic some intervals. And finally, we using those three observations, we basically realized that we can optimize the number of edges of type one because this will basically give you the cost. And I mean, I actually haven't mentioned here Using this whole network, we will actually find the number of edges of type one and not really something else. But that's actually fine because what we want to find is like the total cost. And if we know the number of edges of type one, like the maximum number, then the overall cost, like the smallest possible cost would be this number. Let's call it like K. So we will have K, ed K edges of type one. So overall we will have K multiplied by C1. So it's like, I'm going to write here. So we have like K multiplied by C1 plus uh, M, which is the total number of edges, minus K multiplied by C2. Because like we want to print the total cost, which is the optimal, like the optimal total cost. So yeah, OK. Basically, after that, we showed how to create this network, which I explained. And I mean, if you have some questions about it, again, feel free to ask. But yeah, after that, we just need to run the dependency thing, which is like the max flow with dependencies, which is again, a standard algorithm. So maybe I'm gonna go through an implementation, through the implementation of the author, if you're interested in this. So yeah, basically, here I have opened the implementation of the author. So yeah, let's. I'm going to be showing the parts which are basically not some template because like here we have the template of the dinets, and yeah, we don't really need to go into it. So yeah, let's go into the main function. So first, he basically reads the graph. Actually, those are some initializers, which will, which we will basically use for the strongly connected components and so on. And what we have here is basically we created create the graph, and we have every edge. So adjacency would be like the graph, and this will be the reverse adjacency list of the graph. See, after that, he basically computes the strongly connected components. Then we actually check whether we need to flip the two types. Because as I said, we use this observation that without loss of generality, we can assume that the cost of the first edge is less than the cost of the second edge. So yeah, basically he checks that. And now we will go through all of the constraints. So yeah, first what he does is he reads the type, the vertex, then the label. The label here is basically the type of the the type of the edge or like the label and then left and right which are the bounds of the number of edges for the following constraint so yeah what he based okay i think i got a question so let me check it all right so i'll zoom in a bit i guess 
this should be fine, I think. Yeah, sorry about it. But I mean, so far, okay. Okay, cool. So basically, I mean, so far I have just covered what we are gonna do with the strong connected components. And yeah, I mean, we just basically just compute the strong connected components in the beginning. And then we flip the costs if we need to. So yeah, here, what he does is basically, I mean, just to, oh, I mean, he basically just looks at the last of this, of the, like the label is one or two, but he converts it to a zero or one because it's easier. And then he sorts the label with the flip. And now like if the label is zero, we have a constraint of type zero. If it's one, we have a constraint of type one, of type two. So yeah, uh, then basically we have like the type and here like label, I mean, basically what we do here is this conversion from type two constraints to type one constraints. As I said, like label is zero based. So if label is one, this means we have like a type two constraint. And yeah, we total is like the total number of incoming edges to this strongly connected component. And what we do is basically just the new right bound is equal to the total minus the left. The new left bound is equal to the total minus right and what we do is we do a constraint for this thing which is from left to right okay so this function constraint i'm going to go to it because what it does is basically the fourth of observation which is the combination of different constraints so in other words we have like some pair for it which would be the actual final constraint and then left and right are the new constraint we are adding and what we are going to do is we are basically going to create the left bound being the greater of the previous left bound and the new left bound and also like the sec same for the right bound but like with minimum so okay this way we are basically having some adding some constraints now when we i mean in the else we are basically having the same thing but for versus so yeah Overall, it's like something that size, and yeah, then we have. I mean, it's like the reversed size, and then the adjacent size, and we are basically like adding this constraint to it. So now, what we need to do, like, I guess the final part is basically the max flow, which is. I guess the most tricky part. So yeah, like, like, I mean, right now we have constraints for every strongly connected component and for every edge. And what we need to do is basically, uh, so we have uh, this, I mean, we have the constraints and now we'll see how we will construct the network. And finally, this is the thing I told you where if the maximum flow or the maximum number of edges of type one, or if we talk about zero based labels, labels equal to one, uh, labels equal to zero, then we can just have like C1 multiplied by this K or the flow plus like C2 multiplied by M minus the flow. And we just return the answer. And also like if the flow is minus one, we return minus one. Basically that's the impossibility check. So in this get max flow function, we would basically return minus one if it's impossible. So yeah, let's go to the interesting part, which is actually this function. So again, here he's, the, the author is actually straightly implementing the transformation and he's not using like a complete black box. But yeah, what we do is basically S or C or like the source will be a new vertex. So that's like the first source and sync is like a new vertex. So that's the first thing. So then we have like source one and sync one, which are the second source and sync. So yeah, the main thing is that we are gonna use this function which is add edge. And what it will do is basically we have 
I mean, that's a lambda function for basically adding a constraint with a demand. So it has like a pair, which has two elements in it. The first one is the lower bound in the flow. The second one is the upper bound in the flow. So in other words, that's like the demand for the capacity of this edge. And then we have just the vertex that we are adding this from and the, I mean, the from and to of this edge. So yeah, the first thing is like, if we have the demand being with a flow greater than the capacity, this, I mean, like the lower bound demand is larger than the upper bound. This means that it's clearly impossible. So we just have some flag, which is wrong flag. And I mean, this means that we can just return minus one. So somewhere below, we would have something like, yeah, it's line 187. We would have like, if wrong flag, just return minus one because it's impossible. So then we have like, sorry about that. I'm just going to quickly go back to it. So here in, after that, in this Lambda function, we are basically adding an edge from U to V, but with capacity, the upper bound minus the lower bound. That's what I was talking about with adding an edge with R minus left. And now we have like those demands, which are basically like, that, that's the thing which I was re referring to as degree. And yeah, basically we would have, when we are adding an edge, from, for the vertex it's going from. So like U is, I mean, the edges from U to V. So we are getting like the outgoing edges with a plus and the incoming edges with minus in this degree or, or the demand. So yeah, we are basically increasing the demand of U by the lower bound of, or the left or the L or like the, I mean, the lower bound of this constraint and the upper bound by the right bound. So yeah, we have like those demands. And after that, we are basically just, I mean, the next four loops are basically the initial network I was talking about. It, they basically have like, so this, the first thing is, okay, let's, I'm just gonna go in detail. So the first loop is, it basically goes through all vertices and now it goes through so the first for loop inside of this one basically goes through the edges. And it adds an edge from i plus n plus j. So like n plus j here would be the vertex on the right side, while i will be the vertex on the left side. So yeah, I mean, you can clearly see that we can, when we have a flow between 0 and 1, it's the same whether we are going to call this add function or just normally add, a, add an edge because like, the lower bound is zero, so we won't really change the demand. And like we would simply just do g that add edge with c that f minus zero. So it will be like, I mean, it's basically the same if we write g that add edge or just add an edge with constraint being zero to one. So yeah, that's like the middle layer. Then we have for the current vertex. So that's layer, the layer before the middle one and the layer after the middle one. So yeah, those are basically the constraints that are for vertex incoming and vertex outcoming edges. And finally, we basically have a loop for all strongly connected components. And yeah, what we do is basically we have, have the constraint for incoming and outcoming edges that, that connect the first source, like which is the actual source and the sink. And I mean like, this arrays are basically the constraints, same for vertices. So yeah, finally, what I was talking about with like adding, connecting the source and the sink with uh, the demands. So basically if a vertex has a negative demand, I mean, we basically go through absolutely all vertices in our network and we go through and we look at their demands also like note that here we will also go for the source and sync. I mean, the actual source and sync. So yeah, like if the demand is negative, then we are gonna connect the source with minus this demand. So the, like actually this vertex, note that this is like the second source. So like the pseudo source. 
And if that's not the case, and the demand is greater than zero, I mean, if it's zero, we it doesn't really matter whether we add an edge or not. So yeah, if like the demand is greater than zero, we basically will connect the current vertex with the same. And also, we would need this satisfaction or satisfactory flow will increase it by the demand because like we know that the sum of the demands, I mean the positive demands, would be exactly equal to the sum of left bounds of all edges. So it would be like the sum of left values. And what we basically know is that after running the flow from the source to the sink, so yeah, I mean like now we basically, okay, finally, so here we also check whether the, we had like this wrong flag and return minus one if that was the case. And finally, we add this additional edge, which is from the sink to the source. So it, in a way, it's like a back edge from the from like the right bound to the left bound. And it has capacity equal to infinity. And we are basically adding this so that uh, some of the flow that's going in the final edge could go to the, to the actual sink and go back to the flow. I mean, it's kind of, maybe it's kind of tricky to think about it, but there was like a reasoning in the CP algorithms tutorial. So if you're interested why we are doing this, you can refer to it. But yeah, I mean, basically we are adding this final edge and now we can actually push this flow with dependencies if and only if the max flow from the new source or the pseudo source to the pseudo sink is exactly equal to the sum of the demands we actually found or like this satisfactory flow. So basically we check whether this max flow is equal to the satisfactory flow. And if that's not the case, it's impossible if we return minus one. So yeah, and finally, like what I was referring to, like now we have pushed some flow through some of the edges. And what we basically do is we have this same network and we just call the max flow again with those pushed flows from the source to the sink. And this will actually give us the maximal flow with dependencies. And I think, I mean, the idea is pretty easy. So normally in a contest, if you need it, you just need to remember what you do. And it's basically two steps. You, like about the conversion, you basically have the normal edges with uh, capacity equal to the difference between right and left. You compute those degrees or demands. And if a demand is negative, you link the new source with the current vertex. If it's positive, you link the current vertex with the sink. And then we have this additional edge, which is just from the first, like the actual source of the sink with like infinity capacity. And this way you just can perform flows with dependencies and the complexity doesn't really change because you're only adding a couple of edges and two vertices. So yeah, I think in a contest, it's pretty easy to actually write this up and it's easy to remember because it's literally just two steps to do. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty useful for some problems. And yeah, that like this, the problem in this code chef is an example for a flow of dependency problem. And yeah, so I guess like that was in general the problem and the solution. And I think here, I guess you should just ask some questions if you found out, found that one part, I mean, if you didn't understand one part, just free, feel free to ask some questions. But yeah, I guess. I'll be waiting for some questions. And I, I guess, th thanks for watching. And yeah. So maybe I should open up the Facebook with the stream. So that's kind of tricky though, because it's, okay, whatever. I mean, like, yeah. And if there are no questions, I mean, I hope you enjoyed it and yeah. It was a pretty interesting problem, so.
yeah, I think the in general, like the approach with uh, with dependencies is pretty useful. So I got a question: How to master DS algo? Wait, so I guess DS is like data structures. Maybe I'm not sure. Well, I mean, like in general. Wait. So, okay, yeah, cool. So I, I guess like in general, data structures are pretty cool and actually it's somehow relatable to this current video. It's pretty cool that normally when you, so in a way, like at least what I do is I think of the data structures as some black box, and when I have some problem, I'm trying to actually reduce it to the black box. So. I don't know, like in general, I really like the approach when you're solving a problem to just continuously simplify it until you reach something that you have already seen. And I mean, like normally what when you practice, you would just do the following. You're solving a bunch of problems and you'll now know some general problems, but then you go to a contest and there there is like something hard which that you can't, you don't really know how to approach. So yeah, that's why you try to find some small observations and like by combining them, you actually end up getting, getting to something that you already know how to solve. And this way, when you train, you're basically increasing the knowledge or like the amount of problems you know how to solve. And also like if you're solving some problems from contests, you actually, even by reading some editorials, you see how to actually come up with those observations. So yeah, like during the training, if you focus on thinking about those two, you'll basically reach a point when you just need to make a couple of reservations and you will know how to solve the problem. So yeah, I guess that's my mindset when I'm solving a problem. And yeah, this is very useful in data structure problems, especially because normally the main data structure Oh yeah, and also, I actually realized there is like a link with the feedback, I think on Facebook. So I would be glad if you actually leave some feedback. So yeah, I for completely forgot that I had to ask for that, but yeah. Any, yeah, I mean like, if you don't really have any questions, I guess let's just end the session here. And I hope you enjoyed the editorial. And yeah, if you have some other questions, just feel free to message me either on Code Forces or Code Chef. I'm open to questions. So yeah, it was a pleasure. And I see, I guess, I guess see you next time. Thanks for watching. Oh, wait, there's, you're welcome. <laughs> so yeah. Yes, let me stop sharing then and yeah.